Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am very excited about having this conversation about microaggressions in the classroom. So how are you doing today, Bini? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be able to be here to talk about microaggressions in the classroom with you. Absolutely. I really appreciate your time. I know you're very, very busy. You do such amazing uh, work at CBC. So let's start with introductions. We can talk a little bit about the work we do at Columbia Basin College and how it impacts our teaching and learning practices. My name is Ekaterina Stoops, and I am the Director for Teaching and Learning here at Columbia Basin College. And I just like this format. Uh, when you know we record this, I call them video podcasts. Not sure if that's the right term. I just I think that's you know, sounds great, but um, I really like this format because it just really allows me to interview subject matter experts and like what we will be doing will be exchanging questions. I'll be asking you some follow-up questions. You'll be sharing your examples. And I really, really love this format. And I personally also feel very passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Microaggressions in the classroom is a very important topic. It's, uh, it's just really important for student success. And I am really excited to be asking you all the questions about microaggressions and how we can uh, do something about them. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Bini Moses, and I am the Dean for uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Columbia Basin. Um, and um, I have the wonderful privilege of working on our different diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. I am new to the position. It's only been four months, so very excited to be able to engage with the campus community in not only um, identifying, but also um, having discussions around what our needs are to become an equity-centered um, institution, what that can look like in the classroom, and what that also looks like on campus. And many of the things that um, we want to do is already happening on campus. So that's also really exciting. Um, so thank you for having me. And um, I look forward to working with you um, and your team, Katrina. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Do you want to say a few words about equity focused strategic plan that you've been championing uh, here on campus? I think it's a really innovative project that will ha have a huge impact on our campus community and student success. Maybe a few words about that if, you, if you'd like. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for giving me space to talk about that. Um, being equity-minded, the equity-minded uh, framework that actually was here before CBC, before I joined CBC, is really focused on a strategic plan that was created over um, a year and a half ago. Um, and I'm not really um, sure about the actual timeline. But it's a really exciting institutional strategy that um, is being intentional around recognizing that higher education was built with inequities and also with different historically marginalized communities that were often not incorporated to how we, um, we do curriculum work with uh, how we develop policies and procedures. Um, and also have limitations to accessing support and resources. Recognizing how that system was put in place, but that we as change makers have the opportunity to kind of be the authors of our own goals and journey as an institution um, really um, positions us as a campus who are embracing equity and inclusion work to start with this uh, Inclusivo strategic plan, um, which is a transformational work that allows us to 
really do some internal reflection about how we've done things and how we can continue to make it better to ensure that we are including different populations that are also currently on our campus, but even new people and students who will be coming for in future, um, future years. I think this is just such an important work we're all doing, we're all engaged in. And regarding microaggressions, so this, uh, the, the topic of our, of our video podcast is a very specific to classrooms. And I kind of really like this approach that you and I discussed, right, because it's going to give faculty and all of us very concrete, uh, specific tools to deal with microaggressions in the classroom. And that all is uh, aligned with culturally responsive teaching and equity-minded strategic plan that we are all championing uh, on campus. So regarding microaggressions, let's uh, maybe start with a definition. What is a microaggression? Uh, How do you understand it? And Maybe if you could share some examples and also how microaggressions may impact student success and student learning. Yeah, thank you. Um, Microaggression are um, kind of everyday exchanges. It can happen every day that are can be like subtle insults, put downs that may have demeaning messages it's usually rooted um, in stereotype that's directed towards someone because of their identity or their membership to a marginalized community. It's uh, because it's rooted in stereotype, it really limits uh, one's ability to see people as individuals. And they're grouped um, as a member of a group that may have, depending on our own conditioning, Um, we make assumptions of um, what, um, who they are and what they uh, bring. And and some of those, it could be based on looks, it could be based on race, it could be based on many different things that um, really um, create a uh, a misunderstanding as well as um, a way of kind of prejudging people before we really get to know them. And because we are kind of socially conditioned to have unconscious bias, both conscious and unconscious bias, they play a part in in being in in us um, exchanging and being interacting with uh, microaggressions. The word microaggressions is very interesting because there is this micro and we could just think like, oh, well, they're just not important. They're little things, right? Just develop thicker skin, move on, um, be tough. And I think it's a it's a very common, unfortunately, common mindset. And I've experienced microaggressions myself. I think we all have, and it could be related to your age, it could be related to your ethnicity, it could be, you know, all kinds of reasons. But I think as a society in general, we tend to minimize it. Like literally, I've heard things like, well, toughen up, develop thicker skin. And that's okay. But I mean, at some point, you do have to develop your personal strategies, how you cope with life in general. But going back to the classroom, do you have maybe like uh, one example that would illustrate how this little microaggression, that micro, right, can really impact student learning and student educational goals? Well, I will say that um, I'll kind of backtrack and and talk a little bit about what you shared around um, the, the concept of it being micro. It's one big um, thing that I, I think about when I talk about microaggression is that it can be intentional, but a large piece of microaggression is unintentional because we are conditioned um, and sometimes we are not always aware of our uh, our biases, we don't always know if we are committing a microaggression. And when that happens, there's kind of four things that uh, typically happen in the process of when a microaggression occurs. 
Um, and it could be anything from, you know, constantly mispronouncing a student's name in the classroom that makes them feel like, you know, it's it's week six and I've been an active participant and I'm not seeing myself as important enough to know my, my name or that if students are often, if we're using examples in the classroom that often have negative historical like um, uh, impacts on different people and different social groups that especially in classrooms where there are minority populations and different identity groups um, and even just different ways of us talking and making comments right things like when we we say things that examples of um, I think of um, an example of um, saying you you throw like a girl or yeah. you know, um, to to imply that uh, females are are not as uh, good in sports or that that they may not have uh, the ability to throw like have that strength right um, so there's even those subtle comments or a really common one that I know was used a long time ago was that's so gay. Um, really not thinking about the impact that has on people who are LGBTQ, who have suffered a lot from a lot of negative stereotypes that not only are an interpersonal impact, but also systemic uh, implications. Um, so when a microaggression happens, there's a concept of like clash of reality. And that clash of reality um, is this uh, uh, it happens a lot where people are unconscious about it. So we think about paper cuts. Like when you get a paper cut, it, um, it kind of hurts and then it disappears. But if you're constantly getting paper cuts and eventually all over your body, everything hurts over time. Or if you're slapped, right? If you're slapped once, it doesn't hurt. But if that slapping doesn't stop for a week, you end up bruised. And so when it happens to people, a lot of time that class of reality, because it's unconscious, it could be your friend, it could be your professor, it could be somebody you respect. And you're asking yourself, like, did this really happen? Because this is somebody that I see as a role model. This is somebody that is part of my community. And so um, it can have that, that reality of, a trust, trust and that sense of belonging um, becomes a, a, a challenge for the person because all of a sudden that relationship is questioned um, for the sometimes because there's defensiveness when microaggression happens. And we often, as you mentioned, this thing about like toughen up or uh, toughen up or um, that get get you you I didn't even mean it the way that I did so it creates this like perceived minimal harm of you know um if I didn't I, I've 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 heard this this joke before and nobody's complained so why are you complaining right you're overly sensitive and that invisibility of bias where we uh, assume that you know um that it, there, I, I really didn't mean it. And so it's that combination of I didn't mean it and why are you being so sensitive? So now you're the one. So the person who's victimized by the microaggression is now carrying the burden of bringing something up that uh, is often the case, right? And because there's a positionality or power dynamic, there's a, a catch 22 where most of the time when a person has experienced microaggression, especially in the classroom where there's very clear power dynamics, um, the person is always, the student is always uh, wondering, do I bring this up or do I just kind of hold it in and because of my grade or because of me not wanting to create an uncomfortable uh, environment or be targeted as somebody who's bringing up um, things that people don't want to address. And so that's, it's like you're, um, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Because if you, if you address it, then um, you have to face the consequences of wondering if you're judged. But if you don't, there's, uh, there's mental and emotional stress 
that are is part of that that experience definitely can relate to the mental and emotional stress because it's just at some point you feel like oh, well you know it's just easier to ignore it and move on than to engage because it's just you know the whole like the gaslighting <laughs> it, it really does take time not time but you know that emotional um energy that um not everyone is willing to give um and uh, sometimes just it's easier to move on and pretend as if as if nothing happened but like you said if it happens again again and again that clearly it becomes it, it snowballs and it just becomes a really big problem uh, something that you mentioned really resonated with me and they have a question so you said that in many cases microaggressions are um, not something we do on purpose right so my my question is how do we engage in this uh, self-reflection as uh, faculty members as practitioners as uh, educators in general so how do we go about recognizing them in our own work in our own teaching in our own behavior what's our self-reflection uh, strategies would you recommend because what if we just don't know that we're doing it and um, if nobody points out we'll just keep living our lives without even knowing that we cause um, we, we say things that hurt other people yes yeah that there is some some harm right I, I think um, one of the things that is um, as uh, Dr. Sue, who coined the concept of microaggression, and the original um, framer of this concept is Chester Pierce, who's a psychologist, and in the 1960s, really in his research around African Americans and, and uh, racial microaggressions, but it's been, um, as over time, um, continued to um, we, we continue to expand because there's many different marginalized communities that are impacted by microaggression. I think because of that, and also because of our conditioning, um, we often prejudge. We, we, can, we can prejudge people's uh, way they dress and assume that they might be smarter or their, their opinions are more credible than others or depending on their position, they, um, they have something that we want to pause and hear. Um, with students, sometimes we often, especially marginalized students in higher education, often classroom textbooks or classroom um, conversations do not include the experiences of their people from their backgrounds. And so sometimes if they're bringing that up, it's kind of a one-off. And we sometimes either deny or devalue that experience or culture as something that's relevant to the discussion. Um, sometimes we even assume or question somebody's membership. So if they talk about having a disability and it's not physical, then we might question some of those things. So knowing that some of these things are really part of kind of how we've been conditioned as people, it's important that we recognize and reflect our own biases, um, the way we interact and even our behaviors, because as, as we talked about, it's unconscious. So sometimes we, we don't even realize when we're doing it, right? Um, understanding microaggression um, and really learning about it. I think that's part of us. The more we learn, the more we can identify if it's happening so that we can check ourselves and work to create a safe and inclusive camp uh, campus and classroom experience for the students. Um, recognizing that impact is uh, intent versus impact. Um, like good intentions are great, but if they have negative impact, we have to know that so that we can remedy when those happen. Um, and we offer opportunities to learn, both um, as professors in the classroom, but also as role models for teaching students who are going to be leaders in the community. And that really adds to the quality of education that we're providing. Um, to understand triggers, right, and really unpack them, 
um, really understand and, and notice what's happening in the classroom. What is, uh, are the students uncomfortable? Is, are, are people being singled out? And how do we then uh, make sure that we attend to those needs? Um, those would be some of the things that I would kind of provide. So what are the signs of, like you mentioned, students being uncomfortable and there's some tension. So how do I, how do I notice that? What strategies would you recommend for, for that? And also, what, how do I, as an educator, how do I go about a situation where, say, I hear my students in my classroom are perhaps saying things that making someone in the classroom, they appear uncomfortable. How would I uh, navigate this? It's a conflict resolution, you know, mitigating difficult conversations, having difficult conversations. How, what, what are the strategies uh, I could implement in my classroom as an educator? Yeah, I think I want to, you've, I want to share maybe a story and an anecdote and then talk a little bit about what that could, how we remedy some of those things. A big part of um, being in the classroom, I think, is also really understanding and building relationships with students. Um, we are the ones as, as faculty, you're bringing the topic. So we know whether it's going to be a sensitive topic, if it's going to be political, if there's different sides to that topic. So um, being cognizant about what can kind of take place is important, but obviously we're not always going to be able to have control. Um, I think about an example of a classroom experience where um, the students talked about political systems, you know, different types of democracies, different types of way leadership works. And then somehow it shifted into immigration and, you know, how immigration comes into understanding who is considered a valid person who belongs to a country, right? And a student, a student uh, who is a, a person of color uh, starts kind of defending that position of uh, what that means to be uh, an engaged member of a community. And then a classmate says, oh, you're only saying that because, you know, you're trying to defend the illegals because you're probably one, right? And so that example, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, that kind of changes the dynamics because mm -hmm. now there's students accusing each other. The person who was just trying to talk about the process of who's, who belongs to a community um, and how that uh, engagement should look like has now been targeted as. So it's not just, you know, talking about like illegal immigration, but then saying, you know, what is, and, and we've never in the classroom talked about what that even means, right? What does using terms like illegal mean in terms of excluding communities, excluding people? Um, so in that type of um, an example, I would say that, um, you know, simply is kind of like stop the conversation. And that's hard as a professor, but it's important to acknowledge the moment and then really take back the space as, as the professor in that space, immediately take the lead in addressing the situation about where we have gone to a place where it's not productive. Because one of the things that we want to do is be productive. We want to engage in uncomfortable conversations, but in a way that allows us to uplift. Um, it's always okay to say, you know, let's breathe, let's take a pause, let's reflect on what just happens. Um, it's also really um, helpful to have like classroom norms. Mm -hmm. you know, and community agreements, especially when there will be those conversations so that people are accountable to their actions and there's clarity around what that means when a problematic incident occurs. Um, it also supports students in being able to critically reflect in how they show up and how they participate. 
And it also helps us acknowledge like the emotions in the room, both visible and invisible. That again, going back to that impact versus intent um, and ask students if they would like to kind of, especially the students who might be targeted, the students who are often minority students, um, if they need that break, but not to just dismiss. Like it's really important that we validate um, people where they're at, but also in support that, um, that we want to create a safe and inclusive learning environment for students, right? Um, I think it's also important to not just like kind of dismiss it and move on because that's also a sign of creating mistrust and also um, alienates, especially alienates students who are in from historically marginalized backgrounds. That is really helpful. Thank you so, so much. And you mentioned community, uh, communication norms that are different terms, uh, communication norms, community norms, participation norms, policies, uh, everybody calls it differently, but it is really this agreement or um, like a document that would have rules and engagement norms that you would want your class to abide by. And I always, I, well, I'm a huge advocate um, of communication norms or community norms. And I always advise to actually engage your students in uh, a creation of this classroom communication norms in the beginning of the quarter or in the beginning of the term. So perhaps if you're teaching, say, an in-person class, that could be something that you, you could do during the first week of your class. Online classes, hybrid classes, the same. In the beginning of the class, you would give students your space for this activity. I think a big component to think about is we are providing a learning space. Mm -hmm. This is a place for learning, for growing, and to develop our students to be responsible, reflective, and engaged community members when mm -hmm. they graduate. That's kind of that additional value to the, to the degree that we're providing. And so always centering around that this is a learning space, um, professors can bring some guidelines and then collaborate uh, with the students to say what other things will make you thrive and be active participants in the classroom mm -hmm. so that they can have ownership to the agreements. And so things like active listening, to be able to get the most out of your experience, you are paying to be here, um, but also to be able to really gain from that experience is to really listen, listen to understand. We hope that when we have conversations to be active participants in that because we are bringing, you know, content from maybe a, a textbook that we're reading, but your lived experiences and some of the things that you have, um, you bring, will really add to the quality of um, learning, um, the quality of the learning experience that we're a part of. There's generational differences, there's uh, cultural differences, there's so many diverse backgrounds and perspectives that can really add to the value of a classroom engagement. Um, we we want to talk about uh, intent versus impact, that the reality is we're preparing you for the world. And it's not always going to be, you know, um, I, I think of like Candyland. It's not always going to be like rainbows and, and like happy days, right? There's going to be uncomfortable situations. You're going to engage in um, conflict. And we want to teach you how to do that. How do you own the impact of, um, of your, um, your words and also intent? Like intent is not the same. Know that sometimes your intent in your background and perspective, depending on power positions and privileges, it might seem like it's good. But for people who have been marginalized or people who haven't had the same types of access, that could have negative impact. And that's okay. 
um, being responsible to those things doesn't mean that we're blaming or that we're admitting guilt. It actually just means that we're acknowledging that we don't know and we have room to grow. Um, respecting each other's perspective and also agreeing to disagree, right? Mm -hmm. That we have to, it's part of that educational environment to agree to disagree, but then understand because we we know the different perspectives. And then I think also to just um, add things like, you know, you are here to learn, so keep an open mind um, that we can really share space and that one thing I've used in some of my training is this concept called ouch o, um, which is it's uh, we I tell uh, people when I'm training that ouch means it's a short way of saying what what was just said uh, really um, kind of triggered me mm. a way that is bringing back some historical hurt or trauma, and the o is from the other person saying oh. That was not my intent, but tell me more so I can learn from what I what just happened, and we can kind of um, create some understanding among some of those things. So those will be just a few things I guess I'll share for. Um, but there's so many out there in terms of like classroom norms or community agreements or guidelines that I think can always be used. Uh, well, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This is so helpful. These examples are so, so helpful. If you have more examples, please share with me and we will publish on the website because I think that <clears throat> it's not that we uh, don't... Uh, you know, sometimes we hear these ideas, we need to create community norms, and uh, this is important for student success, but sometimes what's lacking is maybe specific examples, and um, I always, in, in my role, I'm always about strategies, uh, specific examples that I can share with, uh, with my colleagues that can be helpful, and they can uh, take and tweak them and revise them, fine tune them. Uh, but at least there are some, uh, there could be some examples that you could use if you don't know where to start. And I think that what you shared is a, such an amazing start. Thank you so much. Um, that helped me personally uh, to uh, rethink some of the um, concepts around community norms and also participation agreements. Um, my last question is about participation because everything, this conversation we're having right now actually aligns so well with cultural response of teaching. It's a, it's a pedagogy uh, that incorporates all, all different, uh, different approaches, different, different techniques, but it's really, if you just describe it in a couple of sentences, it is really about giving students an opportunity to bring their authentic selves and share their authentic experiences. And the way educators could do that uh, through creating uh, uh, activities, assignments that would help students really open up, bring their unique perspectives, uh, contribute to the to their conversations, not just to learn from the textbooks, which is, don't get me wrong, very important. That's why students go to, you know, universities and colleges, but also learn from each other because we all bring this unique experiences, professional, personal, and many of our students are actually adults right? Especially uh, at community colleges. So the adults who have a lot of experience, professional, personal, and they bring uh, very interesting perspectives into conversations and really cultural responsive teaching is creating those opportunities for our students where they feel comfortable bringing those and sharing those ex experience, uh, experiences with each other. So my question, my last question is about participation, because <clears throat> participation is, I think, in my opinion, is a very, can um, be viewed very different in different cultures, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, like I mentioned, I'm from Russia. In Russia, classroom participation was 
different, you know, expectations from the professors when I was a student, expectations from professors around classroom participations were very different to say how we view participation in American classrooms, right? And if you if you have students who come from different uh, cultural backgrounds and just have different styles, participation styles. So how would you create those experiences for students where they could participate through different means, through different activities. Could you give some maybe examples? Well, I think about um, equity when you ask that question. And I have one, I guess, tool I can share. Um, and when I think about equity, I think about what I shared around that our systems were not created with different populations in mind. So. Our students, um, you know, first generation, low income students of color, uh, many different students from marginalized communities are coming to classrooms and, and already having that sense of alienation. Um, they may not really see themselves. Um, examples in the textbooks, examples that are not, are kind of far from their own um, backgrounds, or they don't see themselves kind of um, um, as connected to those, what they're learning. Um, I know as a college student, um, I often struggled when, you know, we're trying to learn critical thinking skills and, and using examples when we're researching, um, and we can't connect because the content mm -hmm is completely different than our upbringing or our history, um, or even the things, it's, it's a very privileged perspective sometimes. That And then also there's that sense of shame mm. that students feel like I don't wanna be too vulnerable and, and share my story that could end up um, creating those stereotypes that perpetuate and and give uh, and result it in me um, having some negative impacts, and so. Um, but but there but those experiences are so important, right? And so to really frame the classroom around how it can be a rich learning environment, and that all the different experiences are actually going to add value to the content that we are are talking about and that we challenge students to take those kind of risk, create the safe spaces for them to take the risk of, of bringing their true selves and being vulnerable. A tool that I've used to kind of think about different learning style is called think, pair, and share. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. I find that very effective with different students who are both introverts and then also the extroverts because it allows them to kind of balance. Um, that think really helps so that students have a chance to process. Um, not everybody has an answer right away. Um, they're, they're, they take time to like uh, connect the content. And then that pair provides that safe space of just being able to share um, with one person and have um, that shared connection and also that sense of confidence building. Um, and then, uh, or the pair, I'm sorry, that pair piece. And then that share then allows them to kind of come in as a team um, and then share it with the different groups. So that's been something that I've used as one tool that. Um, could be a great way to have students engage in classroom and participate. I love this example of think, pair, share. There's just so much psychology actually behind this activity or strategy because, you know, sometimes we think that, well, anyone can share the opinion in front of a big uh, group. You know, you ask a question and it's like, why? What do you think? And you have 40 students in your class. And then uh, maybe two or three start engaging right away. And then you're not hearing from the rest of the class and you're wondering, Mm, they're not participating. What's wrong with them, right? And uh, actually, simple psychology behind this uh, is that uh, most people, most people would not be comfortable sharing their thoughts, their experiences, their ideas in front of a big group of people. And 
so the way to go about it is through think pair share where you know you can just turn around and talk to your classmate who is sitting next to you. Or if it's a, a Zoom class, you can do breakout rooms and put students maybe in a group of three, even um, in, in a group of two, and just give them five minutes to quickly do that thing pair share via Zoom. Online, that's also possible to set it up. Online, if you're teaching an uh, asynchronous class through Canvas, there's there are also strategy how you would uh, create such uh, experiences for your students. And that creates a psychological safety. It's not as intimidating to actually share if it's just one or two of your peers versus 30, 40, whatever. <laughs> and and then you can just, after that, think and pair. And then there is that share where you kind of already warmed up a little bit, right? And now you feel like, oh, okay, now I can actually share with my class classmates. I don't feel as intimidated and intimidated. So it's just there is actually a powerful psychology why it works and why we shouldn't be engaging in this large class discussions or debriefs where there are a lot of students. And um, I have one more strategy that I actually found that really works is that giving students ownership. Basically, just one um, example of that, um, when I was teaching well, I have 20 plus of uh, teaching experience, so I was, I was teaching a lot of different classes at different institutions of higher education. And I will never forget this one class. And I had students who were from different countries. It was um, uh, English language uh, intensive international program. And we had students from uh, different countries in that class. And I remember towards the end of the quarter, I gave them that final project, a final assignment. Instead of telling them what to do, I said, you have this complete freedom. So this is the topic and you can come up with any activity, any uh, project, as long as you address this topic. And, and I encourage them to work in groups to, to three people. So each group would uh, come up with some kind of product uh, covering that specific topic. And I was just amazed. I was amazed to see the results. Students came up with such creative, incredibly creative ideas. Many of them created those games. Mm -hmm. And then um, the final week of the class was all devoted to, you know, let's play your game. <laughs> And let's do your listen to your presentation. But it was just uh, such a incredible creativity uh, happening in class because every group came up with really unique, interesting activities. Some some groups created games. Some uh, students created some you know display of different artifacts, and some mm -hmm. students actually recorded interviews. So they interviewed community members. Uh, recorded uh, those interviews and then uh, they put uh, put them together in a short film and it was like a video production so there was uh, one group that did that and I was just like this is so much better than me giving them that one assignment that I developed and I uh, I would say you know this is the assignment just stick to the rules stick to the instructions just, just do it the way I want you to do versus here's the topic here are some parameters and come up with creative ideas. It was just such an amazing experience for all of us. And I was just, it was one of my favorite activities. I tested it and it just worked so, so well. But again, it just aligns with this concept of cultural responsive teaching, where you give your students uh, an opportunity to showcase the talent in, a, in their own unique ways. Though, while still demonstrating the outcomes, Yes. Making sure that they meet those learning outcomes that you want them to meet because it's a class and they're supposed to be learning specific things. And so holding them accountable was also very important. So that's yeah. just uh, something I just wanted to share because it just came to me as one of the examples. I, I've done that yeah, with faculty partnership programs and you're absolutely right. They're so great and students just, uh, they're so creative. Um, and it actually really helps them connect what they mm -hmm. know to the content and the materials that, um, and utilizing students as thought partners is so important because they can help us 
create the classroom experience where they're more engaged, which is what we want. Yes, exactly. And also use uh, maybe um, encourage them to share their unique perspectives and experiences that otherwise they wouldn't have an opportunity to share. Because usually we focus on textbooks and lectures and some predetermined uh, activities. And um, if we create those, even once a quarter, (laughs) if we create those opportunities for our students where they can really showcase their talent, their um, experiences and share with everyone through some artifacts, through projects, through presentations, through games, I don't know, depends on your class. That is such a powerful experience for all of us because we, as educators, we are also, uh, uh, we're, we're learning from our students. Mm-hmm. I always, each class I was teaching, I was always learning from my students because I like to give them that opportunity to share the, those experiences with everyone, with me, because, you know, I can't claim to know everything about the world. <laughs> that would be <laughs> really arrogant of me to say that just because I'm a professor. So I'm not the only source of information and knowledge. Yeah. And, and, and that's also role, mod- role modeling leadership and humility and, and just so many other things that I think is really tied to addressing microaggressions. Yes. Um, because that sense of having empathy and kindness um, and really encouraging, um, promoting a growth mindset is such an important way for us to help students see and be productive. Um, see how production and being productive in a classroom experience can in we can incorporate this sense of, I guess I, I'll call it like educational humility, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Vinny, thank you so, so much. It's been such a pleasure. It was fun. I know we could go on for another hour, but we have to stop. <laughs> we have to stop here. Though I really don't want to. I have a ton of questions and maybe uh, we could record a next uh, podcast um, on a different topic that would relate to cultural responsive teaching, diverse equity and inclusion. You're the expert in this field and I just feel so fortunate to have you as my colleague and and I'm very thankful for this opportunity to be recording this session. So we'll post it on YouTube and hopefully it will receive many likes <laughs> because that's what YouTube algorithm uh, likes to do. So comments, likes, engagement. So to promote this uh, wonderful podcast and please subscribe to, so this is to my viewers. So please subscribe to uh, TLC's YouTube channel and hit that uh, bell. It's a notification setting. So you'll be notified if new YouTube videos will be posted. So please engage, please like, please comment. And Vinny, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. You're welcome. It is great to be here. And I look forward to us working together more in the future. Absolutely. Thank you.